Welcome back, everyone, to the Flow Track Podcast. I am Kevin, doing this solo today. Gordon is not here. He's on a trip. Also, probably not going to be back until Wednesday next week on the pod. So a good couple days for those folks out there who are on Team Kevin. Uh, if you're watching live in the chat, you want to know anything about Gordon, want to get something off your chest, now's the time to do it. Like, I won't tell him. Yeah, this is public and everybody will see it. But the one person who probably won't see it is is Gordon. You know, he kind of has, has tunnel vision. He's probably going to be deeply enmeshed in the cross-country rankings over the next couple days. So he may not even see this feed. So speaking of uh, YouTube comments, drop them in there if you're watching live. We're going to have time to answer some questions either about the London Marathon or whatever else is on your mind in the running world. I uh, got an email about Kipchoge I wanted to get to. And I will talk about some cross-country because earlier today, Friday, we did get results from Notre Dame, which were pretty interesting. Before we get any further, though, I want to shout out producer Colt, holding it down as usual. We're going to hear from Colt in a second, too, with one of his world-famous weather reports. Uh, this show, though, brought to you by Gooder Sunglasses, purveyor of sunglasses made for anyone who enjoys putting your body through hell and back. All different types of sunglasses for sprints, 5K, marathon, ultra trail, track, whatever you're running, they got a pair for you, all for $25 or $35. The website's gooder.com, G-O-O-D-R.com. Uh, $25 active sunglasses for anyone. They're about fun, fashionable, functional. Everyone can afford. Remember, no slip, no bounce, all polarized, all fun. Gordon would always run through the problem with the sunglasses, right? They're expensive, they're ugly, they're over-engineered. At Gooder, they're affordable, stylish, all performance. They have free U.S. standard shipping at $50, 30-day Free returns, one-year warranty, 100% carbon neutral, 1% for the planet. You can find your pair at gooder.com. That's G-O-O-D-R dot com, G-O-O-D-R dot com. We thank them for sponsoring the show. Let's get going. Let's get into it. Again, you want to leave some comments in the chat. I will definitely have time to get to them as long as they're good. Props to Tampa Eagle, already in there saying hello. Says, love, love the studio. I didn't build it. It's been here for a while, but we thought it was time to come out of our houses and be in studio. Chance for Gordon and I to be in the same spot. You know, the last time for an extended period of time that Gordon and I were in the same spot, World Championships, he ends up being an intro to a Usain Bolt song. So I thought maybe we could recapture some of that magic when we're shoulder to shoulder here in the studio. But it's going to be a couple days for Gordon. He's on a trip pre planned, and he will be back though. And I think he'll like the studio as well. I think he's going to like this setup too. So let's get into it. First of all, uh, we did the men's London Marathon preview last pod. You can check out that on the site. You also have um, a lot of interviews that have been coming in from London. Remember, it's going to be live on FlowTrack in several countries. So you can watch the race on Sunday morning uh, live on FlowTrack. We talked a lot about the men. I want to talk about the women today. We have three women in this race with personal bests of sub 218. You have four more who are under 219. This brings up a lot of questions. First of all, is that course record from Paula Radcliffe vulnerable? 215, 25. On paper, you're still looking at a couple minutes that a lot of these women have to drop off, but we just came from the Berlin Marathon where Asefa went from 234 to 215 in one marathon. Now she's a special case, she's a special talent. We're learning more about her after the race. But let's just take a step back and realize how good and how historically fast the women's marathon is right now. Four of the top 10 times in history have been run in 2022. Four. And if you go back a couple other years, that's when you have Bridget Koskai running her 214. There's a lot of marks in there from the past couple of years. And this year's lineup in London indicates to me that one of these women is going to be able to break through and run something historic. Now, a lot of that depends on the conditions, that depends on the pace, but you just look at that big three right there of 217 runners, Jepkoska, Yahuwala, Bakere, all sub 218, then not too far behind them. You have a lot of 218 lows in there with Meli, Kabete into career. Career was silver at the World Championships this summer in a very good race and based on seeds she's she's sixth on seed times so i think this one's going to be quick i think this is going to be another one of those situations where you have a fast pace in the early miles 
perhaps even course record pace. And maybe not everybody's going to stick with it, like we saw in Berlin, but I think one person's going to be able to stick with it. Before we go any further, though, we all know marathoning at this level has a lot to do with the weather, how fast they go, has a lot to do with the conditions on the course. So we're going to check in with our chief marathon meteorological correspondent, Colt Joyce, to break down what the London forecast looks like on Sunday. Colt, take it away. Hey, Kevin. Um, unfortunately, this one doesn't look like it's going to be as good a weather as last week. Mm. We're going to get rain. Um, looks like a pretty good chance, somewhere in the 70 to 80% chance. Um, and, I, I mean, temperature looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the 50s. But uh, the rain there, definitely going to be a problem. Interesting. So we're going to get good temps, but it might be a little bit moist out there. Mm. Well, 9 a.m. start time for the women locally, men at 940. Maybe that'll clear because I'm looking at that weather graphic you have up there, according to Google Weather. And by 10 a.m., partly cloudy. We're not, we're not seeing any rain there. But at least it's not hot. Let's put up the wind here, four miles an hour. Not bad. They can manage with that. Keep an eye on that weather, though. Weather was ideal in Berlin. You called it several days out right you, i mean you knew hey that was world record i'm a weather. specialist yeah yeah if there's one question colt can answer world record weather or not doesn't even matter if it's a marathon if you see colt in the street saying colt world record weather or not he'll know he'll be able to tell you i'll tell you what <laughs> drink water <laughs> yeah, I drink. weather's gonna be great uh, David in the chat, I predict no 234 woman runs 215, a brave prediction to make up for Gordon's absence. Yeah, I guess I would appreciate that. If anybody has some Gordon-like takes, you can throw those in the chat and you're basically going to have full immunity because you're going to say, hey, I'm not, I don't believe it. This is just what I think Gordon would say if he was sitting there next to Kevin. That's, that's a contribution that Gordon would make if he was there. Let's dig into these three though. Um, let's start first with Jeff Koska. I'll give the case for each. So Jocelyn Jepkoska, defending champion. Now, she was part of that the big three that we had for a little while. I don't know if it's a big three anymore because you have to include a Sefa now, but that big three was Jepkoska, Jep Cheer Cheer, and Bridget Koska. Bridget Koska scratches from this race. She still belongs up there. She looked great in Tokyo. She has the world record. I'm not going to take her out because of one scratch. Jepkoska is a defending champion, but seventh in Boston. Remember, Boston was that big showdown race very loaded field and they didn't have competition from london for getting the best women and and jeb Koska finished seventh in there but she's still very solid as i mentioned reigning champion and she's still relatively young we could say in her marathoning career like if you told me she could go another level up i would believe you because this will be the sixth marathon that she she starts she's had a dnf in her past but she hasn't really run a ton of marathons. So Jip Koskai, I think is a solid pick. I don't think though she has as high a ceiling as the next woman I'm going to talk about, which is Yalem Zerf Yahuala. Now, 217.23 debut marathon this past April in Hamburg. Fastest any woman has ever debuted in the marathon. She's run a half in 63.51. She did that in the race with Latensebet Gede when Latensebet Gede blew away the world record. Right, so she's number two all time in the half marathon, Yahuwah, and she has a world record in the road 10K. So the question here is, what can she do in her second marathon? What can she do against a field of this caliber? Hamburg Marathon, solid, fast course, but the field that she's going to see in London is much better. Does she have another level up to go? I would say yes because she's run 63:51. We're putting some of these PBB. PBs up on the uh, up on the screen right now. Back in 2022, remember that 64-22 half marathon. I mean, the women's half marathon seems to get the world record seems to get broken basically every two months. But right now, Yahuwala is number two all time behind the Tensepeka day. So if you're saying, hey, who can get the world record, or who can get the course record? Excuse me. Hey, maybe maybe even scare the world record for a bit. But who can who can get that course record? Who can be somebody who can run a 215 like a Sefa? I think it would be Yahuwala. I think she has the biggest, the best ceiling of anybody in this race. 
because we just don't know her full potential yet. And she's just been so fast at the shorter distances, whether it's 10K or whether or not it's in the half marathon. Excuse me. Mike is falling down. I'm so fired up about her prospects in this race. The third woman, Bikere. Bikere. So she was third last year. She was second in Tokyo. So she's the third woman who's run under 218. She got a PB in Tokyo. So she was second to Bridget Koskai in Tokyo. And I thought this stat was interesting from the media guide. It says, in 23 races, she has never placed outside the top 10 and only three times outside the top five. So very consistent, we can say, about Bakary. And obviously, her top end is very, very good. Like when she's on, she's really on. So she's someone who I think could hang around. Maybe if the race goes uncharacteristically slow, the weather acts up. We know that Bakary is has been tested in a bunch of different marathons and she's pretty solid. So keep her in mind as well too. But then you have, as I mentioned, four other women who have run under 219. You got Melly, you got Kibete, you got Career, you got Margetu. It's going to be a very, very deep pack at halfway unless somebody goes full Kipchoge the first half and, and really tries to to shake everything loose. But if they go out at 216 pace, I think basically six of the eight women I've been talking about are going to be able to hold that for at least halfway. And they're going to go for it because it's London Marathon. People take big swings at the London Marathon. Now, if Yahula goes out and is like, man, this, this whole marathon pace, this is pretty easy. I've run a 63.51 half. Like this is, this is no problem at all. If she goes out and does something crazy, and goes, you know, 215 or 214 pace for halfway, then I would predict that it'd be a little bit more spread out. But if it if it's in that 216 range, I think there's gonna be a lot of women there. And then I think we're not gonna see any huge moves until 30K. But I mean, look at the credentials of these women. They all have the capability of putting together something very fast over the last 10 kilometers. So I am predicting something quick. I think. We're going to see a sub 216 in this race. Whether or not we get down to course record, I don't think we're going to get Paula Radcliffe's course record of 215.25. I think that's going to hold, but I think we are going to see another deep race. And I feel like it's deja vu all over again. I feel like every, at least once a season now for a women's major, we're like, man, that's so deep. It's like historic depth from, from this marathon, from that marathon. And it's just the facts bear that out when you look at these all-time list. Like I said, four of the top 10 times in history in the women's marathon have been run this year in 2022. That's crazy. And then you go even farther in terms of depth of performances. Like 219 is not what it used to be. 219 used to put you in in the favorite seat. And and right now it gets you mentioned, you know, in that second pack. So incredibly deep race. Uh, I'm really excited to see it. I think everybody wants to see like what Yahuwah can do for an encore after her debut in Hamburg. And she just looks like she could be someone who could be a superstar in the marathon for years to come. Now, maybe not. Maybe she hit her marathon ceiling in Hamburg. Like she got it right the first time. And yeah, she's going to get a little bit better, but she's not going to be able to reach the heights of Bridget Koskai when Koskai ran 214. We don't know that yet. The marathon is weird. The marathon is fickle. Some people figure it out really quickly. Some people, it takes them 10 times to have their best race. But all the indications are there that Yahuwah could be a absolute superstar in, in the marathon moving forward. Let's check in on the chat. See what's going on here. Again, if you want to channel Gordon Mack, now's the opportunity. He, I'm, I'm just kind of like missing his, uh, his outlandish takes. Like he'd probably say 213, I think would be the prediction. You say that cause guys record is going to get broken. Uh, I don't care about bunch. the rain. I think it's a world record by like three or four people. Cole, okay, thank you. Thank you. Are you channeling Gordon or is that Colt? Oh, I'm just channeling Gordon. I just okay. needed him to feel like he was included in the show. You need the, uh, yeah, I wish you could put some sort of audio filter on so that way we can experience Gordon. Uh, Joshua in the chat says, I'm new to watching races. Are there any rivalries to watch for or close matchups that will be exciting to see play out in the women's field? Yeah, so as I mentioned, they're, 
there kind of was something developing between those big three, Cosguy, Jip Chirchir, and Jeb Cosguy. Only one of the big three is now in the race. But women's marathon running, same thing, this is how men's marathon running used to be before Kipchoge. It's so fluid. Just as you feel like you have a rivalry, something shifts, right? Someone has a DNF or someone comes out of nowhere and then they crash the party. That's just the nature of marathon racing at the elite level. Kipchoge made that the exception. So on the women's side, it's just, it's so in flux. So, so what I would watch for is if Jeb Kozgai is able to win this again, defend her title when Kozgai's not there and Jeb Chircher's back, not there, it's kind of a reversion back to perhaps where we were um, last, last season, last year. But I think Yahuwala is someone to watch as someone who's a, a big talent who can break open this event in the same way that Asefa crashed the party in, in Berlin. All right. David says, 50 degrees and raining in London doesn't feel good. Fair, I haven't been to London, so that's good to know. So maybe, maybe it'll be a tad on the chilly side. Well, how, how warm is it? What's the high that day, Colt? 60, oh, just 60 is the high. Ugh. Not great. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be pretty cold all morning. Yeah, running with a wet singlet is not fun. Right? That's not going to... Uh, Someone in the chat asks about uh, no, thoughts on non-African, top U.S. or Canadian. Pull up that, uh, that list again. Colt, let's see who we got here. Charlotte Perdue, 223, 26, I think would be the favorite. There's two women from Japan, Iwade and Hosoda. Steph Twell is there. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, Purdue looks to be in the best position. Well, Melly... Uh, represents Romania now. So um, I guess that would be the first person you'd say is not representing. Um, she was born in Kenya, however. Um, yeah, I just... Obviously, the Americans did not go to this race, right? We had D'Amato in Berlin, and then we're going to see the New York City Marathon, the Chicago Marathon, going to be more of the Americans in that race. So this is all about that, that top group up front um all right any other questions on london women's field before we get rolling rolling on to the next topic i should say which is cross country folks i tried to avoid it gordon i'm doing this in honor of, of gordon so let's click on that first one uh, women's blue 5,000. There you go. This is the headline right there. Caitlin Tui gets the win over Mercy Chalanga. Gordon and I talked about who should be number one in the nation. And Caitlin Tui makes a strong case here, wins by 12 seconds. This is this race was at, at Notre Dame. Uh, they were even at 4,000, and then Tui pushed away and, and got the win, got a very comfortable win. So, not unexpected. I think we're going to see these two battle again at the NCAA championship. I think if you're ranking things now, I think you've got to put Tui number one, uh, unless you do the Gordon math. And it's like when you win, you don't actually win. It's very, 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 very strange. Um, so good win for Caitlin Tui. Chalangat, I wouldn't count her out. She's just so consistent. And at the very least, I think she's going to finish even on a bad day. Mercy Chalangat's going to finish fifth. But look at the team scores. NC State gets the win, 55 points. Now, they did not run Kelsey Camille. So, actually, if you go up, Colt, go to, just click on NC State's name there on the top right. Yeah, we can get a rundown of who they ran here. So, they ran Tui, Bush, Seymour, Starlipper, Quarzo. It's tough to get in the NC State top five, but Camille is not there. And you've got to figure Camille would be somewhere in that top five. This thing would not have been as close if Kelsey Camille was in this race and it just shows you nc state's depth now again no sure things though i think everybody's going to improve and somebody can have an off race this didn't change anything for me nc state women are the clear favorite i think caitlin tui now moves into the favorite role in the individual side of things uh new mexico second 68 points they had all their top women going um according to the rankings so i think a solid run for them Larkin and Meza Downey go one, two. Alabama is interesting in three. 
only two points back for the Crimson Tide, and they have Ch uh, Chilangat two, and then Ella Momoy in third. She's a JUCO transfer, so watch out for her. The fact that she's only three seconds back of Mercy Chilangat is huge. Now, what do they got to do next to be competitive? You want Taisma to be a little bit farther up. She was 15th today, and Asakol in 18th got to be higher up. But also, the, the big thing with Alabama is the gap from four to five. Now, the gap today, you know, fifth was, oh, what, 32 points there for Alabama. So not that bad, but obviously you go to the national meet, that's going to expand greatly. But Chilangat did what she had to do. Olamoymoy gives them another threat to finish, you know, top 20 or so in the nation, if she's actually running that close to Chilangat. But they, they need Taizma and Asakol to close that gap, and then they need something solid with the number five runner. Um and maybe maybe they'll find it in the coming weeks, but that gap was, what was it, twenty? Let's see, sixteen twenty-eight to sixteen forty-six. So about is that eighteen seconds back to um, back to their fifth runner. So not a bad day overall for them. I think they'll take it. Only two points back of of New Mexico. Everybody's talking about New Mexico being in the mix. Nobody's really talking about Alabama being in the mix. So. A good run, a good run for them. There's gonna gonna need a little bit more to get over that hump. And right now, NC State just looks so rock solid. So they go one. NC State goes one, five, six, twelve, thirty-one, thirty-six, and forty-six. So they have that big gap between four and five. So if you plug, man, if you plugged Kelsey Camille in there, right, and say she gets, say she runs where Samantha Bush or Sydney Seymour run. So say she gets seventh right behind them. I mean, that's a, that's a swing of about 20 points because you're taking away that 31-point score that was in um, their fifth runner. So that would blow things open. Then you'd have multiple people. You'd have your entire top five, essentially, in the top 12 of, of this race, which is where we expect NC State to be. But again, a lot of, there's a lot of unpredictability in cross country. Sometimes there's injuries that happen throughout the season. Sometimes people just have a bad race, and if you're counting on one person that, that score can balloon really quickly. Um, I don't see that happening with NC State. They have a lot of options, got a lot of backup plans, got a lot of contingencies. But I mean, New Mexico and Alabama have some positives that they can take away from, from the race today as well. Um, over on the men's side of things. Look over to that men's side. There you go. Victor Kiprop gets the win. Um, for Alabama. Alabama goes 1-3, but Notre Dame wins the whole thing over Tennessee. Notre Dame's old coach, Sean Carlson, is now at Tennessee, brought them back to South Bend to, to compete. Um, Nicholas Scudder of Charlotte was second in between Kiprop and Kipsang. This meet didn't have the star power uh, on, on the men's side as the women's side, right? Didn't have, we talked about the big four, in BYU, Stanford, Oklahoma State, and NAU, they weren't here. On the women's side of things, you had a lot of the top teams in NC State, New Mexico, and, and Alabama. So not as much star power on, on the men's side. They kept saying, that's a pretty good result for a really fast 1,500-meter runner. And same thing with Yassine Abdallah. He's the guy who anchored. He went to Texas last year. He's the one who anchored the DMR to the victory at NCAA Indoors, and he's mixing it up over, uh, over five miles. So good run, good run for him. Um, intrigued. Tennessee ran Dylan Jacobs, who won the 10K title last year. He got eighth. So um, Tennessee has a really solid one, two. Alabama, as per usual, really strong up front. They go one, three, six, but then a gap back to, to four and five. We'll see if they can close that up um, as the season progresses. That cross-country recap was in honor of Gordon. Hope you're watching this, Gordon. Um, other meets coming today, Chili Pepper, Paul Short, et cetera, et cetera. As of this recording, don't have the results yet. Do not have the results yet. So that'll all get plugged in. Gordon will figure that out as we go. Um, yeah, let me know. Who, who you think should be, who's favored? Men's team or women's team or, or women's individual, men's individual? Who do you think should be number one? I think that was a statement run for Tui, for me. Because it's... A lot of people just win by a second or two in cross country, just wait till the last turn and then make, make the kick. Like she, she put it on that whole final kilometer. Go to the 4K split here, Colt. Throw that up the, click on the 4,000 meter thing at the top. Right? She's right there with, she's about a second ahead of Chilangat, who's about a second ahead of Kaylee Mitchell, 
of Oregon State who ran really well. And then you go to the finish, that gap just blows open there for, for Tui. So she wanted to win. Uh, she, she got it done. And uh, I, you know, she's an NCAA champion now. She's got so much experience, had really great races on the track. Now she's just translating that to the cross country course. Um, I've seen enough now to, to think of her as the, as the favorite. Um, I want to get to this email that we got. Subject, this is from Robert. Subject line, Kipchoge fears a tough course. Channeling their Gordon here. I like it. Speaking of inner Gordon. Uh, I have to disagree with Kevin on whether Kipchoge has anything to prove. For all of his accomplishments, he has not won a hilly marathon course. One has to wonder why the avoidance of New York and Boston. I love the guy, but there's a huge hole in his curriculum vitae. It's going to a course like New York or Boston without Pacers lining up and winning in an environment that is not optimal. All right. I like it. I appreciate the take. I like the subject line about he fears a tough course. Now let's just do a little bit of let's just do a little bit of history here. All right. Has he run Berlin a bunch? Yes. Has he run London a bunch? Of course. He's run those sub two attempts as well. But he's also run in two Olympic games. Now those courses weren't roller coasters of hills, but they were championship style races. There were races where he did not have the benefit of rabbits. Course conditions weren't ideal. Weather wasn't great. He won in Rio by a bunch. He won in Sapporo by a bunch. So let's just get that out of the way first. Now, it'd be one thing if he, all these years, if he was skipping in New York and Boston and just not running anything, like he's just like taking that season off, but he's running other races. And it's very clear. We know something about Kipchoge at this point. He wants to run fast times. That is something that motivates him. Now, whether that's something that came to him before the Monza breaking two experiment, or maybe that's something he's figured out throughout the course of his career, like that is a motivating factor for him. So he naturally gravitated towards these fast courses. And once you start winning, you know, they want to lock you in, right? Those, those race directors, they want to sign you to contracts. So you'll come back and keep running and winning over and over and over again. Also, there's the possibility that he doesn't think of New York and Boston the same way I think of New York and Boston. Like I want to see him do it. I want to see him get every course record at every major just because it would be fun it would be a fun thing and i think it would be an accomplishment that would suit this legendary athlete and it would be something to add as robert mentioned to his resume but maybe he doesn't feel the same way about new york and boston as i do now whenever he's asked about it now he says oh i want to do all six but ask yourself this question have you ever heard an athlete say yeah no i'm not into that marathon or I'm not into that race. They always are very polite and are very diplomatic, as they should be. They're not going to say, hey, no, I have no plans of ever in my career stepping foot in that city. So, of course, he's going to say yes when he's asked about it, right? Because you're not going to close off any sort of possibilities. I also have to say my opinion of this, it changed a bit after Berlin because it's clear he's still capable of breaking the world record. It would be one thing if he was skipping New York and skipping Boston to go run more 202s and 203s in Berlin and London. We might think that's boring. And judging by the scope of history, it shouldn't be. But that's just, okay, we've seen, okay, we get it. But he's still breaking world records. And I think as long as you're doing that, I don't think anybody can reasonably say, hey, stop doing what you're doing. We've already seen that. Go run a hillier course because I don't think you can beat that course. Which brings me to my final point on this, right? There's always two competitors or two groups of competitors for these elites. They always talk about this, right? There's the people on the start line and then there's the, the course itself, right? So if you're saying, man, I don't know if Kipchoge can, you know, New York and Boston, that's a different, that's a different beast. That's a different animal. Don't know how he'll handle it. He's never He's lost one race, two races in the marathon, right? One in London, one when he was just getting going, he lost to Wilson Kipsang and got second. So he's had one, I'd say one bad race. One race where the marathon itself beat him. Every other time, and he's going on 20 marathons, Kipchoge has not folded, right? He has not 
lost to the course. The conditions have not beat him. And even when like he's beaten every competitor in the race, he's still been able to manage the distance. Now, he slowed down a little bit in Berlin, right? But I think part of you and me, too, thought when he went out in 59-something, maybe he's going to do a huge po positive split. Now, he did positive split again, but you can't ding him because he broke the world record, right? So Kipchoge can handle the distance, obviously. So throwing in a couple more hills in Boston and New York, and I get it, they, they have hillier courses, but it's not as if, you know, he's running an ultra marathon here. Let's, let's, let's dial back just how daunting this would be for Ilya Kipchoge. If he was going to prep for New York or Boston, he'd probably add some hillier runs to his repertoire and be just fine. And also the expectation would be different. Nobody would expect world record from Kipchoge in those races. They might expect course record, in which case Boston would be kind of fun because he'd have to wait till he gets that tailwind behind him to beat Jeffrey Mutai's time. But the expectation wouldn't be go run a world record or, or this is a buzz. It would just be to win. And we've seen what happens when Kipchoge's main focus is just to win. Think about the last two Olympic games and how much he dominated. It's not, it would not be an issue for Kipchoge to just go out there and get the win. Um, especially if you're looking at the fall season with New York, where you're competing with Chicago, Berlin, and now Valencia, which is ascendant. So a lot of the faster guys would even go to those marathons. So I don't even know if he was in New York, if he would have that much competition. Again, do I want to see it? Absolutely. I would have loved to see it by now. Do I think he's not running them because he's worried about how hilly the courses are? No. But if that's what it would take to motivate him, like that's like he needs like that sort of critique, then I will say, Kipchoge, you got to prove yourself on those hills in New York and Boston. Like you got to get there. If that's what it'll take, I will lay the bait for him so he can show up and, and run in New York and Boston. Because again, I want to see it. I want to see him complete the, uh, I guess the cycle, I don't even know, the Grand Slam. I, there, there's not even a name for it because it's so crazy that anybody would hold all six course records and win all six major marathons, or I guess seven if you want to throw in um, the Olympics as well too, at one time. That's just crazy. That's just crazy. Um, David asks, or David says, why would he run Boston a downhill ineligible course at his peak? He also said he wants to run on a marathon on a ship. Um, and then he, in his best Gordon impersonation, Bolt never won a Hilly 200. That's right. You never saw Bolt sign up for a Hilly 200. Um, yeah. So, but where are we in Kipchoge's peak? That's the other thing you got to ask yourself. Because I get what David's saying. It's like, well, you only have a limited amount of opportunities to, to run these historic times. Why would you take one of them um, off the table and, and do it in a course where you can't set a record. But now, now you'd say, all right, well, the peak is over. Let's just, let's just check these two boxes before he says goodbye. And I think a lot of the commentary, and I'll admit to this, myself included, was thinking we only had a couple of years left of peak Kipchoge or even like really, really good Kipchoge. I didn't think his, I didn't think he would break that marathon world record. Like I thought that was going to be it. And I thought he'd move on to other things. But now that we know he can still run faster, it changes everything. It changes how long he's going to compete, which means there's not this time crunch of, oh, he needs to go right now and run this marathon. And it also changes our expectations of what he can do once he is there. Because it would be fun to see him in Boston with the tailwind. Because then, yes, it's a hilly course, but then it becomes a really hilly, fast course. I mean, think back to, was that 2000, 2011 in Boston, Mutai, 203, 02, a time that made our eyes pop out and now would be like, oh, so you got third in Berlin. Or, oh, you got fourth in Valencia. But back then, the 203, 02, I think we all were stunned to see that one. Um, but yeah, Kipchoge's peak is not over, right? We have no idea where we are in terms of his career as a whole, which makes forecasting the end of his career very difficult to do. I mean, it's like plotting how is this show going to end, right? And then you find out they get re-upped for three more seasons. It's like, well, hold on. We were figuring out which characters were going to live and which characters were going to die. And now you tell me that 
that it got picked up and we're going to do this for four or five more years. Well, that, that changes everything. And that's kind of how I feel about Kipchoge. Everybody was writing the ending chapters of his career. And he said, hold on a second. I'm going to run half a minute faster than my world record. And then you guys are all going to change your opinion. Um, so it's a fun question. It's an interesting question. Again, I, I hope he does it. I admit though, because I'm from the United States that New York and Boston, like that's a very, like that, that's probably different to me than someone who's not from the United States. And, and also, you know, he has these tie-ins with these, these races, but I think the mo he's, he's so thoroughly checked every box that it's a natural inclination to move to what's the next thing. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And I think the good news is if you're a Kipchoge to New York or Boston fan, the good news is now you know that there's more than just a couple opportunities left because even if he even if he you know slows down he still has so much of a gap on everybody else that he's going to be relevant in the marathon if he wants to be for at least another 5 years all right check in on the chat you got questions put them in here now Tampa Eagle says please add a track and field pod once a month during cross country and marathon seasons maybe best events or performances or upsets or surprises yeah we can do that we can do that that's a good note i like that um it just gets difficult you feel like you're being very repetitive oh i'd say that after i just did my seventh kipchoge monologue of, of the past month but because not not a ton not a ton happens but i guess we could re revisit some stuff maybe do some all-time stuff some lists some revisions I'm, I'm i'm not against that um Cole, how do you feel about that? You're part of the show. That sounds great. <laughs> I would say questioning Kipchoge now is kind of like saying to Tom Brady, do it in the playoffs. It's kind of, <laughs> I don't know, like what? He's already done it. I don't know. You've never won in the snow. Well, wait, hold on, maybe. <laughs> Cliff says, will Latenza bet good day or Bridget Koska break 210? No, I don't think they'll break 210. But I think they could break 214. Good day, that's going to be interesting. Debuting in Valencia, which I think is a bold move. She has a relationship with that city. That's where she ran the fast half. But that just signals to everybody, I'm going for something crazy fast. And just look at all the insanely fast times that have been run in Valencia over the past couple of years. And not, not just in the marathon, in the, in, but in the 10K on the road. Like all these road performances, like there's something going on crazy on those Valencia roads. But no, 210, I don't see it. I think you run 63.50. I think, I think the world record's in danger when you run that fast for the half. All right. Anything else? Colt, thank you for producing. You did great. Thanks. It's been a fun show. I like being in the studio. It's, uh, it's fun to get a different visual going instead of just stare at the back walls of everyone's rooms for hundreds of hours. Yeah, so people might think, hey, Gordon got that cool picture made up of himself, like Photoshop dunking, and then the chat was watching. Like, what happened to that? It's still on his wall because we had a meeting, <laughs> and it was in the background. Like, he, he had the exact same setup, which confuse. if you think, like, people tuning into the show were confused about why is Gordon dunking and the chat is admiring him, people who <laughs> were in the meeting had no clue. Because they don't know Gordon's aspirations to be a dunker. Email address is flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. Flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Gooder, for sponsoring the pod. Again, you can watch the London Marathon live on Flowtrack on Sunday morning. We'll have a recap. We're still sorting things out uh, Sunday morning or on Monday. We'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, the, the race, hopefully you guys can check it out. It'll be on Sunday morning. We'll talk about it. Again, watch out for Yahoo Law. And if you want a sleeper, I don't know if you're able to bet on these things. Maybe if you're in London or something, you can. Um, Judith Career. I think she was going to rabbit. it. She's really good, though. Second and 218 at Worlds. Probably get good value. So check out Career. Um, but I'm really interested in Yahuwah Law. And then on the men's side of things, obviously we ran through that field. If you want to 
do a deep dive into that our last pod um you can check that out but yeah check it out london marathon on uh on sunday october 2nd thanks everybody for tuning in live and for checking us out after the fact um this was fun talk to you guys next time